Hi, I'm Alex Wood, and uh, I'm on the SDK 3D team, and with me today is Ed Mackey. Ed, you want to talk a little bit about yourself there? I've been a 3D graphics engineer here at AGI uh, for over 20 years, and uh, recently I've become involved in the uh, GLTF 3D file format standard from the Kronos Group. And we're going to be talking a little about that today and, and showing how we build some of these uh, using Blender and, and other tools, and potentially how we load them uh, into SDK. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what we uh, set up for today is uh, we have, uh, we're going to build a simplified model of a CubeSat, a 3U CubeSat. We hope that with this exercise, we'll have some exposure to PBR material authoring, so PBR physically-based rendering. We'll dive into that in just a bit. We'll be using Blender, and we'll show how one might build a model uh, author materials, author articulations, and get that into SDK. Um, but uh, the content that we'll be covering is applicable to, uh, you know, GLTF in general and, uh, you know, in any sort of uh, uh, application or uh, rendering tool. So uh, let's dive into what is GLTF. Uh, so GLTF is uh, a runtime model format. Uh, and it's maintained by the uh, Kronos Group. So they, um, you may have heard of Kronos before. They are the maintainers of specifications such as OpenGL, Vulkan, WebGL, uh, Collada. And uh, GLTF is the newest model format uh, designed for runtime. So what that means and why this, why you should care about a runtime format is that it's been carefully, it's a published format. It's been carefully prepared and structured so that uh, it's, going to the applications that are reading GLTF files will uh, efficiently uh, be able to pull that content from disk or network stream and send it over to the GPU. So emphasis on fast, emphasis on low memory footprint, uh, power footprint. Um, so uh, yeah. yeah. I would agree with that. And, and I'd like to distinguish it from uh, the so-called interchange formats. There, there are a number of formats out there that are sort of very high-end interchange formats, uh, USD and like that, that, that are meant to run on these ultra high-end Hollywood render farm type equipment. And they don't take into account the needs of actual end users with clients, with, with uh, portable smartphones. And um, so GLTF is meant to be uh, very much a runtime, a delivery format. Uh, I've been calling it, uh, personally, I've been calling it a GPU ready format. Uh, I like that. It's, uh, it actually originally was meant originally just for WebGL. It was supposed to be get all your data ready to go into the WebGL API, and then instead of sending it to a graphics chip, you bundle it all up into a file. And that way, when that file comes across the network to a battery-operated smartphone, it just pops out of that file. It goes right onto the GPU, and it renders right. without so any, any fuss or calculating spline curves or any of that nonsense. You pull it out of the file, throw it on the, on the graphics chip, and boom, there it is. I, you said keyword there. It was meant for WebGL. It's still yes. widely used by WebGL, but, but. Uh, GLTF 2.0 came along to yes. kind of uh, make it accessible accessible to all the different platforms, all mobile, the graphics APIs. Uh, desktop. desktop uh, S AGI Vulcan. uses it in SDK, which is a desktop application. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, 2.0 uh, really brought that to the mainstream by embracing uh, what's known as physically based rendering. Um, yes. So. Uh, physically based rendering, it's uh, you, you're not. It's not emulating physics. Uh, what, uh, what we mean by physically based is that it's uh, representing physical properties of a material, and so you'll have these different knobs of how metal a piece is and how rough that part is, and uh, you know whether or not there's ambient occlusion that's kind of uh, providing self shadowing. Self shadowing. When you, when you composite all of those properties together, you get some really physically plausible materials, uh, and uh, it's. I mean. The one thing that GLTF has absolutely uh, successfully done is brought physically based rendering, um, you know, uh, to the masses. It's everywhere. So there's a huge ecosystem for GLTF. Um, Windows 10 uh, it ships with uh, you know Paint 3D, which is essentially well, it's a GLTF Paint viewer. 3D. Not a, yeah. How to mention Paint 3D? Sure, it's 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 the uh, <laughs> cutting edge technology. Right. Here. All the power <laughs> users are are using Paint 3D, yeah. and actually we we. Uh, I mean, Microsoft has been an amazing uh, supporter of GLTF. Yes. Uh, if you open up PowerPoint, one of the recent PowerPoints. The latest version of PowerPoint has yeah. built-in support. You can drop a GLTF right into your PowerPoint, 
and even do a slide transition from one to the next where the whole 3D model rotates around. Yeah, so it's it's uh, it's in Facebook. Uh, it's uh, it, it's uh, the major everywhere. game engines and visualization systems. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and why that and that's so so what right? Well, uh, that's important for us at AGI because uh, when there's content that's created, um, we want that we, we want assets that are used uh, across multiple applications to be used in SDK as well. So you author it once and you can. Uh, present it in many places. It gives us great interoperability between Cesium and SDK. Mm-hmm. Um, so for that reason, GLTF is just a natural fit. That's right. So um, yeah, as I said, we're going to start by uh, really taking you through the uh, GLTF authoring pipeline because uh, I know you've got uh, you know uh, those of you out here who are watching have uh, you know assets and uh, systems that you'd like to represent in uh, SDK. And uh, or and any of your applications, and we want to kind of show you what that authoring pipeline looks like uh, from end to end. Yeah, that's right. what we're hoping to show off today. All right, so let's get into it. Okay, so we are going to start with a NASA press release that I found. I went looking for CubeSats. I thought a, a CubeSat is a nice little tiny satellite. It might be representative of something that somebody might want to put into SDK. And I went looking around for images of them, uh, and I found a, a NASA press release online, and it it had a couple of images that I could download. Um, so this is uh, um, f- photos courtesy NASA, of course. Um, these are uh, pictures that they released of a, a test satellite that ended up launching a couple years ago, I think. Um, and we're going to try and make something similar to this uh, using Blender. Um, I'm not going to go crazy deep dive through the Blender fundamentals. If you're not familiar with Blender, there are plenty of other getting started videos uh, out there on Blender. Um, so I'm not going to I'm not going to go into the basics of how to use Blender, but I am going to build this model uh, or a, a sketch of this model uh, uh, so that we can test out the GLTF workflow, see how things get exported into GLTF, see how materials get exported into GLTF. All right, so that we will launch uh, Blender. This is version 2.81a. Yeah, that that version's important actually because it's uh, was uh, version 280. 280 was the first one right. to offer GLTF export. So when you install Blender, you have the ability to export to GLTF natively. Yes. So that's important. Um, if if you've installed a, a recent version 280 or or later. Sure. And, and the GLTF exporter and importer have been getting a lot of improvements over the last few versions. So um, certainly uh, 281 or 282 uh, are good versions to, to treat as, as minimum. Uh, so there is a default cube here on my Blender screen, and it's not the right size. Let me uh, just take a look. I, I also looked around for some uh, reference on what size these CubeSats are. This one is called a 3U CubeSat. It's 10 by 10 by 34 centimeters. So we are going to try and make a model that looks like that. I will, uh, I will actually get rid of the default cube. It's how all Blender videos pretty much start. And I'm going to add that same cube right back again. But this time when I add it back, I have a little menu here that says how big is the cube that gets added. And this was a 2 meter cube. And I, of course, want it to be... Um, actually, I typed in 0.1 meters, but if you like, you could type in 10 centimeter there. It converts it to 0.1 meters for you. So now we have this little tiny cube. I'm going to hit the letter G to move it, and Z up a little bit, and that wasn't too accurate. For now, I want these numbers to be round numbers because we're going to pretend that we're making a nice engineering grade model, although this will not be that. This will be just a uh, sort of a quickie sketch representation. Model, representation of what this CubeSat might sort of look like. Um, so I have number pad buttons. Seven is top view. One is front view. Three is a side view. Those are orthographic views. And then if I move with the mouse, I can move around like this. Um, and if you want to learn more Blender basics, Blender has a whole YouTube channel where you can sort of catch up on uh, all this stuff and how to do it. Uh, so my 
cube here is the right size. So that's a one U cube we have. This is a this is a one U. This is a ten by ten by ten centimeter uh, one U cube sat. I'm gonna grab. I'm gonna do face select mode and grab this top edge. Uh, okay, I've made this mistake before, but you'll notice this orange dot in the middle of my cube. Um, that's actually, I moved the whole cube up. I didn't move the geometry up. I'm going to apply that. I did not mean to do that. So I'm going to apply that location to set the origin back to the origin. I don't want that origin to be anywhere else other than zero, zero at, at this moment. All right. So my top face of my cube is, is that I want to put 34 centimeters here. That's 0.34 meters. And here we have the rough shape of our body of our CubeSat, this interior part here. It's going to be that size, more or less. Um, and one of the things I do when I'm modeling stuff like this is I look at the reference and I think, hmm, I don't want to uh, repeat work here. Part of the reason why is it ends up looking too handmade if I repeat the work. And these things are often precision machined. So if I make something once, I want to make duplicates of it everywhere else so that it looks like it came off uh, an assembly line or something. Um, so I noticed some radial symmetry here. It looks like all four corners might be the same. Um, and certainly the, the solar panel arrangements look the same uh, on all the sides. Um, so I'm going to cut this thing into quarters, and we're only going to model the one quarter. And to do that, I'm going to hit Control-R. This is loop, cut, and slide, and we're going to double-click there. I'm double-clicking. The first click does the loop cut, and the second click immediately finalizes it without doing a slide. I don't want it to slide. Um, it looks like it slid anyway, doesn't it? I'll just fix that. All right. So I'm going to hit R, and then see it, it's, it slides if I'm not careful, and I don't want that slide. I'm going to manually put a zero in there so that I get a perfect uh, quadrant out of it. So let's take a look at this. I will uh, select some, whoops, I'm inside of it now. Um, we're going to go to uh, what's called X-ray vision mode uh, so that we can, oh, I need I was about to cut away the, the quarter of it, but I want to add a, a foot to it first. So let's let's do another loop cut. And this one I will slide down somewhere around here. We'll call it uh, that. And we'll do one more loop cut here. That was negative 0.7. I'm typing in numbers uh, just to get the same amount of cutting because I wanted that to be a perfect square. Right, because if we go back to that reference image, there's some feet that uh, kind of pop out, and there's also yes. that side rail. There's a side rail, and there's little feet. Let's look at the reference image again. There's this this metal side rail here, and there's these little feet at the top and at the bottom that, that stick out from that rail. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm attempting to cut free here. And just to clarify, we are 3D graphics developers, not CubeSat operators. Or... Yes. So we're not going to make this... <laughs> so, well... If they're not feet, we apologize. <laughs> <laughs> for using the wrong term <laughs> for the CubeSat community, we apologize. Um, all right, so let's take a look. Actually, let me uh, see. This is a problem that I would like to talk to you guys about. There's When you make a model that's as small as a CubeSat like this, you get this clipping against the near plane here. If you go into the View menu, our, our near plane clipping is only uh, 0.1 meters, so that itself is 10 centimeters. That's, uh, that needs to be a lot smaller. So I'm going to set that to one millimeter, and I'll bring, bring in the far plane as well. Um, and that way we can get a lot closer to this thing before it starts to clip on us. And that's what we need to have to continue modeling correctly. So, all right, so let's grab what's going to be our top yeah. Our top foot here. It goes six and a half millimeters. Six and a half. Are you reading that off of some? He's got the specification for CubeSats over there, and he's looking up dimensions, which is the right thing to do. So uh, this, what did you say, 6.5 millimeters mm -hmm. is for the top foot? Yes. And then the bottom foot is seven millimeters. All right. 
So we're going to go to the bottom foot. And the bottom foot is going to come down with an extrude command, and it's going to come down 7 millimeters, like that. OK, doing pretty good so far. Now the next thing, if we look at our reference again, and there's sort of this rounded edge here. They don't want sharp edges on these things that are handled by people wearing spacesuits for some reason, so they round the edges. Um, so I'm going to hold down Alt and click on this edge. And that attempts to, holding the Alt key there, attempts to select the entire edge loop. Um, and in this case, there's no loop. It just ends up selecting three edges, the main one and then the edges on the feet. Right. And actually, you can see that in your little indicator in the status bar yeah, at the bottom. Somewhere down in the bottom, edges three of 76. So you can see that I have three edges selected there. I'll hit Control B for a, a bevel effect on that edge. And there's my bevel happening. I will uh, roll the mouse wheel and make that a little more rounded. Maybe something like that. So we have a nice rounded edge on our rail there. Uh, so, and the other thing I want to do is this yellow circuit board pops out a little bit from the rail, so I think I will, um, I will grab these polygons and have them pop out. F and for that, I'm going to do uh, extrude faces along normals, so they can pop out like this. That's a little too thick. I see a negative sign there, so I'm going to say uh, just one millimeter of popping out. That's going to be our, it's, it's a very thin circuit board, but I won't do want it to pop out like that a little bit. All right. Seems good. Mm -hmm. um, now. Probably time to start replicating this. Yeah, let's, uh, let's see if we can copy this around a little bit. So I'll go back to vertex select mode. I'm going to view from the top. And I'm going to Alt-A to deselect everything. Um, and I will need to be in my uh, X-ray view modes so that I, let me show you what happens if I forget that part. If I, if I try and select these vertices and I'm not in X-ray view, I'm only going to get the top ones. I'm not getting the bottom ones. The X-ray view, even though it doesn't look very different, it lets me select all the way through this model. So I can select these vertices and I end up getting the bottom ones as well as the top ones. And those are all the ones that I would like to delete because they are part of the other three quadrants that I've not put any effort into modeling. So I'm going to uh, delete those vertices, and turn off X-ray, and now we are left with just a single uh, corner of this CubeSat, one, one fourth of our CubeSat. So it's time to make more of them. We make more of them with this thing called the Array Modifier. There it is, it made a second one. I'll, I'll space it apart so you can see it. Of course, we want four, so I'll increase the count to four. But you may notice it's not putting them in the right place. It made a, a line of them. It didn't uh, wrap them around the origin the way I would have liked. Uh, and indeed, there does not appear to be an option on here uh, for spinning or wrapping of any kind. So what we need to do is use this object offset. So I'm going to create a new object. It's going to be an empty object plane axes. It's a very big plane axis. I don't like it being that big plane axis, so I'll make it small. Uh, but the main thing I need from that empty object, first of all, I need to know what it is. I'm going to call it spin 90. The sound effects are free. Um, and spin 90 is going to have a 90 degree rotation about the z-axis, which in Blender is the vertical axis. Now in GLTF, it's y is vertical, but during the export, that's going to get uh, converted for us. So we, we're going to stick with uh, a z90 rotation on this thing. Okay. So you have an uh, you have this empty object, and it's rotated 90 degrees about yes. the up axis. Yes. Okay. And so I'm going to get rid of my relative offset, and instead use my spin 90 object as my object offset. So for each, what it's doing then, I guess, is for each copy, mm -hmm. each mirrored copy of that original piece, it's applying 
that the transform that's defined on that spin 90 that you have, which is a 90 degree rotation. Yes. Okay. And we can also tell it to merge some points together, but be careful with that. You see this default distance is uh, too small. It's one centimeter, it looks like. I'm going to uh, make it a very small merge distance because I don't want it to destroy little details of anything I'm doing. Right, so effectively merge any points that are co-located otherwise. Yeah, uh, any points that are co-located to within one-tenth of one millimeter because anything larger than that and it, it might start merging my circuit board back to the main body or who knows what. Um, that's just because I'm dealing with such a tiny model. I have to keep uh, sort of decreasing the size of what Blender thinks it's dealing with. Now's a good time to save. Now's a good time to save. All, it's always a good time to save. Um, so I'm going to uh, save this as um, CubeSat 3U, maybe. I don't know. Save as. All right. Um, let's... Let's take care of this little problem. There's some uh, some flat shading here. I want this object to be smooth shaded. So I'm going to hit shade smooth, and you can see it's uh, it's really, a little melted. It's, it looks a little melted. So what you do is you come into uh, the normal panel here, and we'll turn on auto smooth. Auto smooth is going to help it figure out that the the edges that have shallow angles, in this case less than 30 degrees get to have their normal vectors smoothed together. Mm -hmm. And the, the sharper edges, the 90 degree ones, are going to stay as sharp edges. It's not going to try and smooth over those edges when it's calculating the lighting. So we have that. And the other issue we have is that um, I want to identify these circuit boards as being different from the, the body of the satellite that's behind them. So we're going to use a material for that. Um, there is... Uh, of course, there's a, a default material, which uh, I will call uh, the frame of the CubeSat. And I'm, I like to put mat or material at the end of my material names. It's uh, just a habit that I have. So that's the frame, and I will add a new material slot here, and this is going to be the circuit board. Uh, so we have circuit board material. Uh, these are just placeholder materials, These right? are placeholder materials. Uh, they're going to play a role later when we make uh, better uh, PBR-type materials. Um, but uh, for now, they're just placeholders. I'm going to declare the circuit board to be sort of more, more of a, a yellowy-orange color. Somewhere in there. And nothing's assigned to that yet. So let's look. Oh, so I went back into edit mode. And you'll notice that only one quarter of my CubeSat is editable. Um, so I have that array modifier in there making the other three, but they're essentially shadow copies for now. Eventually, we'll make them real. Um, right now, they're just shadow copies. So if you were to pull that face out right now, it would, it would be, uh, that action would be yes, applied to all of those all, copies. All four of them. Uh, would so if, yeah, if, if I pull one out, all four of them go all at once. Um, because whatever changes I make apply to, to all of them all the so, way around. Same goes for assigning materials then. Yes. So if I assign my circuit board material, now I'm still in solid shading mode and there's a, a different viewport display thing way at the bottom of the material section for the solid display. But rather than deal with copying colors here and there, I'm, I'm just going to switch over to um, viewport shading mode so I get the main uh, base color showing up here on my material. And the lighting looks a little blown out. I'm going to switch over to this sort of darkened uh, studio environment. I think will be slightly better. And the other thing I notice is that my metal is not actual metal. Uh, let's go back to my materials and say that the frame, which is my frame material here, uh, is going to be metallic. So metallic is zero. I'm going to type the number one and hit enter change that into a piece of metal. That seems good. Okay, let's save that. And what's next? Should we do some uh, solar panels? Some uh, solar cells? Yeah, let's do, the, let's do the solar cells. Let's get these solar cells going, okay. 
So for some solar cells on this thing, let's see. I think probably the best way to do this, I'm going to grab the cursor and plunk it here near somewhere near the center of where the top one goes. Um, and then I'm going to fine tune that cursor location in the view menu over here. You can come over and you can hand edit these locations. I'm going to zero out the X coordinate of this and that's going to get me that perfect center. Um, I don't really care exactly where it is vertically, but I picked up the depth of it by placing the cursor. It automatically tagged. I placed that cursor in an orthographic view. So it, it tagged the depth of that circuit board correctly. Um, and then uh, I've also zeroed out the x-coordinate, so I, I have it um, horizontally centered within that circuit board. So now let's uh, go back into edit mode and deselect what's there. We're going to add a plane. Too big. It's too big. We'll make it very small. Uh, it's a little small. I see it replicated there on all four sides. Yes, the array modifier is doing its thing to this plane as well, isn't it? Um, so let's, uh, let's give it a 90 degree X rotation and it's, uh, it's sitting right on the surface. You'll see some flickering that's called Z fighting and that's good for now. We're going to get rid of it, but, um, the reason it's good for right now is it means that that plane is sitting exactly against the circuit board. So I'm going to give the solar cell some depth to stand off of that, sur uh, off of the board. But before I do that, I want to get the right shape. So let's make it smaller on the z-axis, maybe like this, something like that. And then I'm going to grab these bottom two vertices of it, and I'm going to bevel them. I'm going to hit Control-B, which would normally bevel an edge, and then I'll hit the letter V, and that is the vertex beveling mode. So now I can bevel individual vertices. Uh, and then my mouse wheel controls how smooth they are, and I'm going to roll it all the way down to get a perfectly flat bevel. Uh, like that. There we have it. So that sort of looks like the shape of maybe one of these things with these little flat cutouts here. Uh, so this needs some extra depth to it, so we'll hit uh, uh, Control L is select linked, so I can select this thing and we're going to extrude it out on the y-axis. Uh, actually, I'll extrude it out a little too much, and then I'll put in, looks like that's a negative number, so I'll put in negative one millimeters. And we get a one millimeter thick, uh, which is probably too thick, but I, I want there to be some thickness to it so that we don't see through it. So we don't have that Z-fighting issue going on. So there's our solar panel. Okay. Now, maybe a little high. When you extruded that, that yeah. we have uh, that means it also has a back to it. That yes, it does have a back to it, doesn't it? Yeah. Let's get this um, let's get this cursor out of here for a second and take a look. So to get rid of the back to it, let's uh, let me turn on uh, somewhere in here. There's a uh, a display of normals. So the normal vectors show which way is forward for each polygon. Uh, and I can check and make sure that um, all of my polygons are facing the right way. And now I'm going to um, hide this one with the letter H. And I will hide that one with the letter H. And now that I've hidden a couple of polygons, I can see that there's one here that is facing the interior of the CubeSat. And that's not too big of an issue ex until it is an issue. It's the rendering engine would certainly clip that away, but I don't want that big polygon taking up space in my UV atlas. I don't want it stealing any real estate that I'm going to use for texture mapping. So I'm going to delete it because we don't need it. So I'll hit X, delete faces, and it's gone. And then I will hit Alt-H to unhide um, all of my uh, polygons that I hid before. So now we have a nice, shiny, metallic, not blue solar cell uh, on the side of our CubeSat. Let's add a material for that one as well. So we will 
uh, in object mode, we add a new material slot, and I'm going to call this solar panel material. So we'll make that blue, kind of look like a solar cell. Yes. And, uh, uh, and then we need to assign it. So I will select just the one polygon and hit assign. Oops. So when I selected it, it automatically picked the frame material because that's what it was. So now I'm going to assign the solar panel. So you can see it going all the way around because it's got our array modifier like everything else. But I would like to make an array of them vertically. And I don't want to make an array of CubeSats vertically. So I will uh, separate this piece of geometry out from the main body. So let's hit Control L to link. I, so I hit the front face. I hit Control L to select linked. And I'm going to hit P for separate selection. And what I've got now is I've got two different objects. One is named cube because we started with a cube. And one is named cube01. Uh, those are terrible names. This one named cube should really be named CubeSat, because obviously. Uh, and then Cubo one is just a temporary name for right now. It has this modifier with the spin 90. I'm going to get rid of the spin 90 from it. And instead, I'm going to use a constant offset on the z-axis. And that is going to let me make an array of these uh, vertically. Uh, maybe let's, uh, yeah. Yeah, that works. That seems good. So we have a vertical array of these things. And, uh, I don't want to just bring them back to the main object just yet because uh, if I did, it would just switch back to being that uh, ring of four around the top. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do destructive editing. Are you ready? Um, I'm going to apply this array modifier because I'm done making this array of uh, solar cells. So we'll apply it. And now that I've applied it, all of these things are individual real things. So if I were to grab one and move it away, the others don't come with it because they're, they're all individual copies now. Uh, so now that I have that, I will, uh, I'm going to um, select that object, and then I will hold Control and select the main CubeSat. And now I'm going to hit Control J, and we see the, the solar arrays fold back into the main CubeSat body, and now they're being affected by that original array modifier. So now they're going all the way around. So what you did is you actually, did you, I guess, joined it? Yes, Control-J was join. Um, and, and so now that those things go all the way around. Excellent. Okay. So that's a, that's a good stopping point for the, um, for the body of this thing. And uh, the next thing will be to uh, create the little, uh, little flap that goes mm. on the side right here. Right. Okay.